Expectations are high that new electric aircraft will transform the ways in which aviation supports transportation within and between cities, and especially new vertical takeoff and landing models. But with only three years to go until some companies claim the first of these will start taxi services in places like Miami, Los Angeles and Singapore, there are some big questions to be resolved in terms of what infrastructure they will need to have on the ground. Also, it's not completely clear how these new aircraft will fit in alongside existing modes of transportation. Future Flight spoke with independent expert Daryl Swanson to find out where and how these new aircraft will be able to operate. So wherever you see helicopters operating, uh, you'll see EV tall uh, operating. Uh, as for EC tall and East tall, so those fixed wing electric aircraft, they're going to operate out of uh, existing uh, airports. Uh, the East tall aircraft, the short takeoff and landing ones, uh, that's actually very interesting because that gives you an opportunity to operate out of uh, a lot of more small airfields, uh, which could actually be closer to people's uh, origins uh, and uh, destinations. Not all the new aircraft will land and take off vertically. Some still have wings and will require more space to operate. But generally, nothing like as much space as today's aircraft. So ESTOL is, is uh, electric short takeoff and landing. Uh, ECTOL is electric conventional takeoff and landing. Uh, and ESTOL aircraft, it's, it's about having multiple motors uh, along the leading edge of, of the, the wing, which gives them very good performance so that they can take off in a very short distance. And we're talking about 150 meters of runway length for some of them. Uh, and some uh, operators are claiming even shorter. So all of a sudden, that means that uh, you could almost do a greenfield airport, so a brand new airport with a 150 meter uh, runway uh, that's quite small um, and contain the noise footprint on the airfield so that you're not disturbing anybody. So does that mean that the new aircraft could land almost anywhere? Well, not exactly. There are people out there saying that uh, there are rooftops uh, that are 150 meters long um, in city centers that, that you could be operating these things out of. I'm not as optimistic as, as that being a reality, but uh, definitely uh, in, in smaller communities, uh, there is the potential to develop a green stall port. They're, they're called stall ports. Uh, technically, London City Airport is a stall port because it's a, a short runway and, and very high climb out per performance uh, for those aircraft, very specific. Uh, but you could consider those, those uh, stall port uh, operations, so they could get a lot closer uh, to the areas of demand. But the fact remains that in many cities today, helicopters are still somewhat limited in where and how they can fly. So should we expect the same restrictions to apply to EVATOL aircraft? Well, uh, where there's existing helicopter facilities, that's that's an easy start. Uh, and in fact, lots of people are saying that's exactly where they will start. And that's because you have proven traffic systems, you have tr proven traffic management, you you know where the, the, the demand actually is for it right now. Um, and the great thing is because they're uh, electric, they're going to be a lot quieter, so they'll be more socially acceptable. So I expect those existing heliports uh, to be developed first. Uh, but the challenge that they have there is that they're not necessarily big enough to handle the types of volumes uh, that you need to make this commercially viable. Uh, so eventually we'll have to develop uh, bespoke uh, Verdiport facilities, which will be a lot larger uh, to take more operations uh, because it is commercial aviation and commercial aviation is all about uh, getting high passenger volumes to pay for the infrastructure because the infrastructure, unfortunately, is just going to be expensive. City dwellers might well imagine that they're just going to be able to hop on and off the new aircraft wherever it suits them but it likely will not be that simple in practice. Some people are talking about uh, a verdi port on every other rooftop, and that's something that I, I don't support uh, at all. Um, but you can have a number of verdi ports uh, strategically located uh, across uh, a, an urban area city uh, that's interconnected with the public transport system, because I think that verdi ports uh, of the future have to complement and not compete with um, public transport systems. Uh, and that's because uh, local authorities and, and uh, people designing cities are, are trying to reduce the uh, amount of car usage in the city centers because they're polluting, they, they create a lot of noise. Uh, 
Um, they're not very efficient. Um, so I, I think that they have to be as close as possible to where people want to go to within, say, two or three kilometers or a mile, a mile and a half. So you can use your Mark 1 feet to get there or micro mobility, which is absolutely uh, fantastic. Uh, bicycles are another great option. Um, but then again, your, your transport systems, your bus and, and your underground uh, or uh, subway system. So, so that's why I, I don't believe in every other rooftop, but uh, a reasonable number of high volume verdi ports uh, to get people where they want to go. The UK capital, London, is just one of the major world cities that stands to benefit from urban air mobility. Daryl Swanson and designers Pascal and Watson are working to resolve how the right infrastructure can be put in place at key ground transportation hubs, such as St Pancras and Waterloo train stations. So with Pascal and Watson, we we developed a a concept on the back of St Pancras station a few years ago. Um, And the the latest one we did was uh, at a site next to the Thames uh, River itself on top of a building. So we're we're assuming that we have a new building. So it's a rooftop vertiport two landing areas for FATOs, 10 stands, um, and the facility itself would handle about uh, four and a half million passengers per annum. And this is what I mean by commercial volumes uh, of aviation, because it's just going to take that kind of passenger flow to uh, to pay for it. But there would be connections directly into Waterloo Station, the underground, the, the over the heavy rail uh, itself. We would have a connection uh, to a, a ferry terminal uh, on, on the Thames River itself. So, again, we're trying to really increase uh, that connectivity. A lot of attention is having to be paid to how the new Evatol aircraft can safely coexist alongside existing planes, trains and automobiles. In terms of where they're operating in the airspace, um, there is challenge. Uh, the, the London airspace is some of the most congested airspace in the world. Um, but uh, the, the Thames uh, option or the Waterloo option or wherever you end up there is great because there's an existing uh, helicopter route there called H4. Uh, so all the procedures are in place. All the air traffic control systems are in place to manage that traffic today. So as we uh, evolve and the system evolves and we get more vehicles in the sky, then uh, UTM comes along, uh, which is a, a way of just, just describing uh, an air traffic system that is automated so that the vehicles are almost communicating with themselves. So they're automatically separating themselves out uh, to de-conflict. Um, and that's just something that's going to have to happen in the industry anyway. And the great thing is the, the drone industry is starting to put in some of that base infrastructure because drones are going to get there first because they're not certified to the same level of safety uh, because they're not as big. So to be able to handle that traffic, same systems have to go in. We'll just adopt it, uh, as, it as it becomes available. The companies developing Evatol aircraft expect them to work long, hard days to earn their keep with high volumes of flights. But that's going to take well-thought-out arrangements for recharging their electric batteries or refueling those with hybrid electric propulsion or possibly hydrogen. They're going to take a lot of power to recharge them. You want to recharge them quickly, so that requires huge uh, flows of of, uh, of power. But the great thing is we've got the time to plan for it. Um, And uh, in in the U.S., they've been developing a lot of charging stations for electric cars. Uh, So they've they've got some good experience in in how you do that. And it's a, a lot of it comes down to actually talking to the utility providers and saying, hey, we're looking at doing something here. Uh, what do we need to do? But then you can start to take a look at uh, the, the various other users in the space. And can you look to, to work together with, with other developments uh, to try and pool your resources, to try and reduce the impact um, in, in terms of, um, of how much electricity you, you can use? But of course, we also have hydrogen as well. Um, how do you get hydrogen to the top of a, of a building? And, and the, the real answer is you don't, uh, not with the existing fire regulations. But uh, hybrid uh, vehicles, uh, they will have a much longer range. So you don't necessarily have to recharge with hydrogen at the top of the roof. They may have a battery component with it, so you can recharge that. So there's this wonderful set of combinations uh, that, that we're working through. And, and uh, yes, we're, we're, we're getting there. It's just going to take a little bit of time. The ground facilities needed to support Evatol aircraft won't come cheap. And that begs the question as to what will be the business model for the new vertiports. To borrow a phrase from Star Trek, uh, idic, infinite diversity and infinite combinations, uh, I think. Um, 
you you have OEMs out there at the moment. Uh, so Lilium uh, is is one of them, and uh, Volocopter. They want to build their own infrastructure. In that context, they want to develop infrastructure specific for their vehicles, and that's great. Uh, I don't necessarily see that as uh, as the way going forward. I, I think it's probably better that you have in, uh, specific infrastructure developers because they'll develop infrastructure that will. Uh, service multiple different types uh, of aircraft, and that's the system we want. Um, Uber was proposing a closed system where only their partners could operate, but that's a natural monopoly, and I don't think that uh, is, is uh, looked upon very favorably. Uh, so I'm, I'm all about trying to open up uh, to as many operators as possible, and I think that just means that um, a, a developer, somebody like Ferrovial or others, might come along and start to develop uh, the infrastructure for, for multiple uh, players to come in there. The airlines themselves, they might want to. So what do ambitious city leaders who want their communities to be part of the advanced air mobility revolution need to do now? Planning, planning and more planning. Um, one of the things that I'm doing with NASA at the moment on a couple of different working groups uh, that I'm helping out with is coming up with this concept of uh, system master planning uh, for aviation because Typically, in city planning, um, they haven't really had to in, in involve aviation that much in their in their uh, planning aspects, other than that you have a large airport outside of the city, and uh, you'll interface with that somehow. We're bringing commercial volumes of aviation in, into a city center, so we really need to think about what um, what that system looks like, that combined system. So this is a, the, the planning side. We need to come up with the right policies uh, to support it. So right now in the UK, there is no national planning context or no national planning guidance that would allow a local authority to assess a planning uh, application. Uh, so they, they would have to assess it as a heliport. And if you're specifically looking at London, London, uh, the, the actual London plan itself is anti-aviation, uh, I would say, in, in that the mayor wants aviation to cover its environmental costs, uh, doesn't necessarily want the expansion of airports. Um, we need to adjust those policies so that they can accommodate uh, advanced air mobility, which is a more green form of travel. So, again, it, it starts at uh, the, the planning policy level, and then it starts to, to work down into the actual detail. Uh, the great thing is uh, cities like Orlando and Florida are just about to go through this process with uh, Pro Real uh, and Lilium. So we're going to learn a lot uh, of, of, of what those planning applications look like. And there's a cunning plan at the moment to do a similar mock planning application uh, in the UK. Well, clearly, a lot of work remains to be done to prepare the way for electric aircraft to start flying in and around our cities. It would seem that engaging with local government leaders and community stakeholders is a key part of the process that will need to be stepped up soon as companies prepare for the so-called ecosystem to support advanced air mobility operations. Well, AIN's new futureflight.aero platform is drilling down into the detail to make sense of the new aviation technologies and business models. We're posting fresh news day by day. And subscribers get access to exclusive stories about what's happening throughout the industry and also to our extensive database of new aircraft programs and the companies behind them. You can subscribe for free to our weekly newsletter, which brings you highlights from the future flight world every Thursday. We'll be posting more of these videos explaining the context for advanced air mobility. So thank you for watching this one. And please do find more of our coverage at Future Flight. Dot arrow.